have a panel today on the topic of funding, and specifically funding privacy tech for everyone. So on our panel, we're going to have Zaki Mannion, the advisor to the Cosmos Project. He's an executive director of Trusted IoT Alliance, uh, is a prolific contributor to the development of blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. Howard Wu, who's a founding partner at Decrypt Capital, advisor of blockchain at Berkeley, and is launching Decrypt Capital to fund privacy-focused projects, and also works with cryptography and ZK Snarks, researcher at UC Berkeley. And also Ronan Kirsch is the moderator, founding partner of Decrypt Capital, and co-founder of Blockchain at Ber Berkeley. So I'd like to welcome you guys to the stage. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, so this is going to be the most exciting panel of today. So please wake up, listen, and tweet everything these guys are saying. Um, they're very influential in the blockchain space. So um, yeah. So I'll let you, Howard and Zaki, introduce yourself first. Um, tell us how you got into uh, the space, kind of what's your background, and, and why privacy. Yeah, so hi, uh, my name is Howard. Um, my background is in computer science and applied math from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, I work on uh, cryptographic libraries such as Libsnark, which is uh, used in uh, Zcash. Um, I'm an advisor for blockchain at Berkeley, and uh, I'm now a co-founder for Decrypt Capital, which is a blockchain investment firm for privacy-preserving protocols and early-stage ventures. Um, my personal belief is that uh, privacy is a fundamental right. And um, you know, this is something that really starts for, for me from uh, my childhood. Um, I grew up in Silicon Valley, and uh, my background has been you know, very early on having exposure to the web. And I found that um, having that exposure has shown me just the kind of power that the web can bring. But at that same time, uh, that means having a lot of responsibility. And to that end, I think that data ownership is something that uh, is very important for individuals, and it's something that I personally want to champion. Uh, so, my name is Zaki Manian. I've gotten, I got involved in blockchain because it was kind of this hobby that I developed in sort of 2012, 2013. Uh, I got interested in how cryptography and Bitcoin work, taught myself how cryptography works, like all of the math, um, started contributing to blockchain projects, and um, all of, a lot of the things I worked on have sort of blown up. Uh, so, now I have like power and responsibility and I try to exercise that in an intelligent way. Uh, why privacy? So I, part of what brought me to this whole space was in 2012, so I've been a pro software engineer for about a decade, and in 2012 I started realizing, oh, computers are incredibly insecure. Uh, and I always, always knew that, but then I realized, oh, it's not so much that it doesn't matter. It's not so much that like, Everyone was happy using their Facebook and shopping on Amazon. It doesn't matter that computers, everything's being surveilled and computers are insecure. It turns out to matter a lot, and what's happening is governments and criminal organizations and large corporations are exploiting that information. And so we've seen the internet weaponized against ordinary people like across the entire world. And privacy and basically cypherpunk technology is probably the only method of defense that we have for society. Uh, against sort of computation run amok. So that's why I work on privacy. Thank you. So we're going to discuss uh, kind of three channels of funding. Um, one in the academic funding and industry funding and governmental funding. And then we'll discuss a little bit about uh, where we see uh, the vision um, of this privacy going. Um, so when it comes to academic funding, um, in, your, in your view, what is the current state of privacy funding in academia? And how do you think we can incentivize more individual companies um, to actually fund um, this, this research? Yeah, um, so I would say that like, the current state is, um, needs improvement. <laughs> um, first off, I think that um, having funding for basic research is very valuable. Um, this is something that, in, in our case, like, cryptography is the great enabler for privacy. And um, cryptography is something that uh, has uh, been fairly new. Like modern cryptography is only 50, 60 years old. Um, and uh, to that end, its basis in mathematics is something that is uh, really critical to its development. Um, basic science is something that, uh, generally speaking, doesn't have as much of a go-to-market. Um, so funding uh, it 
doesn't give you the same incentives as funding applied sciences. Um, you can look at other areas like you know, AI, machine learning, big data. These are all things that um, companies really like to fund because uh, it has quick turnaround and it has uh, immediate applications. Um, I think that you know, one, one view on this is that right now with things like blockchains where we are building out uh, protocols from the ground up using uh, these cryptographic primitives, um, you're starting to see a lot of this basic science uh, translate directly in into these uh, direct uh, use cases. And that's something that I'm very enthusiastic about and I think that uh, it, can, it can become a, an avenue to fund this basic research. So one of the things I find really cool about Zcash is that we that, that the community went for, and like the company, the technology went from an academic research project to a production system in like in approximately like five years. Um, and that's insanely fast in any space. It's really fast in computer science. Uh, it generally doesn't work that way. It's really, really fast in cryptography where typically academics discover something and then 20 years later somebody decides to put it in a system. Okay, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So ins insanely, insanely fast. Um, so, so that's really cool. And clearly the, bas I, I think it's relatively clear that the basic research side is underfunded. Uh, but it's probably like if we two or three X the funding in cryptography from where we are right now in academics, we pr we're probably done. Like that's probably what like we've achieved like funding is no longer the rate limiting factor. Uh, so it's not so much, that's not the part of privacy research that really worries me. Because I think probably by the end of the, you know, sometime in 2018, assuming the cryptocurrency prices stay where they are, um, or go up, or only fall by like 50%, um, we can get to two or three X where, we, where, where funding is right now. Yeah, I want to add on top of that. Um, so we're working, we funded blockchain at Berkeley which is doing a lot of consulting with uh, Fortune 500 companies. And as part of our proof of concept that we're building, um, it always ends up as, okay, the data that we wanna uh, use is not, is not gonna be private. Our competitors are gonna know about this. Um, the world is gonna know exactly what we're doing. And this is not acceptable from uh, competitive advantage as well as uh, recent compliance. So we see that um, one way for us that we're able to incentivize them to invest in research uh, in professors at UC Berkeley that are doing research in privacy space is because now they understand there is a need that they actually they want to get access to that information. They want to understand how to be the first one to be able to use the public chain uh, in a private way. And I think that's something that you see Alibaba has invested in a little bit, uh, some money. Um, Qualcomm has been invested some money in this. So we see that this one way to incentivize by showing them that yes, you can use it, but there is some you know, there's some privacy concern that you should be aware. And then now, if they really want to use it, they're actually going to invest in the research to get a first hand over their competitors if, if that's what they're looking for. Um, so just on top of that, so do you think that privacy translates into any products or services that can be used for consumers or businesses? And like, maybe you can give us some example that you see in today's um, stage. Yeah, um, Zcash. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that f fundamentally speaking, like this is something that is um, very much a basic science that is uh, has a lot of applications, and um, developing that in in the blockchain world is very useful. Um, it's something that, generally speaking, is not just a, a, a computer science or math thing. I think that business, economics, law, these are all areas where you can also contribute to that. And um, having the societal incentives and societal implications of funding this, I think, will help to grow the space much more. And that, in and of itself, is a feedback loop back into, into the sciences. Um, Zcash is like a really good example because uh, a lot of that work was developed by professors um, in the academic world, and uh, that work became something that was built out as a protocol that is used in Zcash. Um, Zcash is the manifestation of this protocol, and the technology is something that you see is being directly used now in the real world for financial privacy. And uh, this technology uh, has given them a valuation of like 1.8 billion at, at, at current time, and um, that's something that I think is uh, one of those things where you want to pay it forward and have that go right back in and, and fund some, some further work in this space. 
So it's very cool that Zcash, like we, we took the crypto basic research and we deployed it so quickly. The thing that worries me is so far the consumer facing side of sort of blockchain privacy hasn't yet delivered that much privacy for the consume for the hundreds of thousands of people that are we're adding to the blockchain space right now. Uh, most of them are just interacting with the speculative assets through exchanges where they have essentially zero financial privacy and all their records get sent to the IRS. Um, so on one hand, like, yay, we have this cool, these cool new cryptographic primitives that we've turned into a production system. On the other hand, we haven't really delivered that much privacy for regular users. And on the enterprise side, the enterprises are like, we're not even gonna get started with blockchains without privacy technology. So the enterprises are definitely going to, when they consume blockchain, they're gonna consume it with privacy of some kind enabled and probably using sophisticated advanced cryptography. And we probably we have an obligation to figure out how to make sure that that technology is available also to the regular consumer users of blockchain. And it's still really hard to figure out exactly how to do it. So just to add on top of your, so what do you think are the ways to go beyond that speculation? Like what do you think we need in order to, to get to that point? You know, does it, it's gonna start from enterprise and then trickle down to consumers or um, you know, bottom up from consumer to enterprise? So one of the benefits of the massive amount of funding that we've gotten over this year is we all have to go for like enormous markets um, in this space. And really on, the only markets that are big enough are small business consumer markets. It's no longer enough to just like be a research project for a Fortune 500 company in blockchain anymore. Uh, not with the amount of money that we all have to deploy. So that's really cool. But now we have to build an entire industry in a relatively short period of time, which is kind of how I end up on a funding panel because we're like, this, was, this year was the year of raising capital or last year was the year of raising capital and this year is the year of deploying capital. And we gotta figure out a way of doing that. And is it, so like, do I have any like big picture answers? No, other than like, it's going to be a lot of work and more people should work on it. Thank you. Um, so we, we'll jump to more the industry funding part. Um, so there's, you know, big data uh, all around us. Like you said earlier, companies are monetizing our information, making maybe, I don't know, say Google, maybe $80 a year on each uh, individual. Maybe you can talk about it more. Um, but so, so what do you think are some rights that users should have over their data? And um, should they have profits on this data? Like, what, what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, like, data ownership fundamentally is something that can be controversial. Um, there's, there's this book uh, called Data for the People by uh, Andreas Weigand. Um, he's the former chief scientist at Amazon. And uh, in it, he, like, outlines six, like, basic rights that he thinks uh, uh, should be uh, for people and their data. Uh, it's, like, to amend your data, to inspect the data refineries, to, like, um, append, to, to port your data. Um, to, to experiment with the refineries and um, to blur your data. Um, th these, are, these are six things that uh, he proposes as kind of like your bill of rights for data. I think it's, it's an interesting proposal and uh, it shows something fundamental about the space which is like people right now don't have the same awareness about data that like um, the companies do. It's, it's a bit of an asymmetry and uh, having understanding on what they do with it and also what you can do uh, is one way to raise awareness about privacy. Um, like I, I'm really interested in seeing all the different models that are happening right now. Like one is uh, with like Brave Browser. They're trying this um, ad replacement idea. Um, you know, you can you you are putting users with advertisers and publishers. Um, you get to actually get a payout for having seen the ads, or you can forego these things. Um, it's it's a different model, and, and and I'm really interested to see all the different approaches that are happening right now. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think that users and consumers should have more ownership on this. So one of the things I've always observed is that Europeans tend to approach this from a rights-based framework that like, you have a set of rights, like the rights that you just outlined, which are a good set of rights. Um, and Americans tend to approach uh, this from a sort of liability and regulatory arbitrage based framework. Where, so regulatory arbitrage is basically the question of what is the regulatory 
responsibilities slash overhead I have from holding a bunch of users' data? Um, or, and can I avoid that by not having that data? Um, so can I make my business um, sort of more cost efficient if, or be able to address new markets because I don't have to jump through a bunch of regulatory hoops because I don't have this data? Um, the second, the second sort of is, you know, what if something, you know, I get, we get hacked, we get breached, and then we have to deal with it. Um, and sort of the strategy in the United States for the last uh, decade has been to avoid, is to like, avoid regulation and avoid uh, uh, the, the sort of liabilities associated with breaches um, so that you can build these business models on top of mining people's data. And, pr and I think the most hopeful thing is that all of that seems to be unsustainable at this point. Um, the breaches are too bad. Um, there, it's only a matter of time before a company's business is utterly destroyed um, by a data breach and the liability associated with it. In the healthcare space, it's probably the fastest moving sort of, where it's, in the United States, it's $75,000 is the maximum liability per patient record in a breach, um, which is enough that it's like material now. Like insurers are unwilling to insure small doctor's offices because they're concerned about the potential scale of liabilities in a breach. And so if we can get there and then have technical solutions that allow you to operate systems where users have sovereignty over their data, then maybe we actually end up in a good place. Um, discussing a little bit about, you know, you spent a, a little bit of time in Silicon Valley. Um, you grew up in the Silicon Valley. You know, there's, I'm not sure how many people here are, you know, kind of been there for a while, but I'm interested to know what's kind of your perspective on how, you know, venture capitals in the, in the Bay Area do they, do they help enable privacy-friendly tech? Do they think it's, it's a big issue, or they think it's just a niche that, you know, some people will take care of it, but it's not, like, a big concern or a problem that we should focus on? Like, what's your take on it? Um, well, I, I used to be a, a software engineer at Google, and uh, I would say, like, from the inside, like, it, I feel like the companies are uh, become more aware about this, but, um, you know, first off, they are taking a more privacy-centric view on data, but remember that their bottom line comes from user data. Um, like Google itself is an advertising company. 80-something plus percent of their revenue comes from their ads. And so to that end, you know, the controls that you can give on data is uh, something that you have to have very careful, uh, careful controls on. Um, if you just allow people to just wipe things and uh, go away, um, if they come back, like, what are you supposed to do? You know, the, the information itself is something that uh, is core and, and important for their business. So to that end, I think that a lot more can be done on that front. Um, I, I would say that uh, this is a space where users really need to be um, aware about what's happening, and that's where being vocal is important. If, if people aren't vocal about it, companies aren't uh, incentivized to change, and also you know, if there is no competition to disrupt them, then th they themselves will be complacent about it. So. I would say that, in general, Silicon Valley sort of perceives, especially in the venture capital world, there's a perception of an opportunity around privacy. There's, especially there's a perception that, but there, the business model is not proven. Um, there hasn't yet been a big success out of venture capital funded uh, privacy technology. So venture capitalists, periodically, in fits and starts, get excited about privacy, are willing to throw some money into it. Um, there are you know, powerful people in the Silicon Valley that are very ideologically sympathetic um, to privacy technology, and so experiments keep happening, and you know, Zcash initially getting funded was one of those experiments. Um, and Zcash has definitely been one of the most successful of those experiments, uh, just in terms of return on you know, dollars invested. Uh, but there still needs to be more success in this space before Silicon Valley, like uh, Silicon Valley capital sources, are really willing to, you know, really throw down in the privacy space and build like uh, disruptive privacy alternative, privacy preserving alternatives to like Google and Facebook. Yeah. So just to bring up Zcash and blockchain, um, now it's kind of you know on Forbes, it's all over the mainstream. Um, you know, individuals that you never thought will, don't even understand, you know, computers and how do we use them. They, they call you to ask about, you know, different coins and what to invest in. So that's definitely something that people are starting to get aware of. 
Um, what do you guys think? Do you think the blockchain is going to be able to um, enable that um, awareness over privacy? Because, you know, a lot of, you know, protocols out there are pretty transparent. You know, you can see everything on them. Um, is that something that people would care about down the road? And, and maybe, you know, Zcash, Monero, Dash will be one of those things? Yeah, not all cryptocurrencies are created equally. Um, I would say like in Zcash's case, it shows you the theoretical upper bound on what privacy can be. Um, but generally speaking, this is a spectrum and uh, the community kind of comes to decide what they value with their dollars. Um, I will say, I, I find that, you know, this example is, is something that I often give with people. Like imagine you need to wire money to your friend and they give you their bank account number. No, knowing their bank account number uh, reveals nothing additional about their financial history. Now, if they were to give you the, your, their Ethereum address, um, you would learn everything about their financial history. You would know maybe they're extremely wealthy. Uh, you might know that they're addicted to crypto kitties. Um, but the point is that you know, it reveals a lot more than, than what you would currently expect with a traditional banking infrastructure. And to that end, um, I think that this is something that people should come to realize and come to value. Um, I, I fundamentally see this as like, you know, we wear clothes for um, like our physical privacy. We have meeting rooms for conversational privacy. Um, you know, we have bathroom stalls for other privacy. Um, and uh, you have digital tools for, uh, you, you should have tools for, for your digital privacy. And uh, this is something that in, in this space uh, I think is a bit underappreciated. Um, and uh, things like Zcash are a great example of getting that type of threshold of privacy in the digital realm. So there's, there's a couple of research priorities that are sort of generally have been competing in the blockchain space for the last couple of years. Um, so one is like generalized programmability. Um, and the correctness and safety of those programs. The other one is scalability, which is like how many users can interact with the system at time. And then the third one is privacy. It was, it's sort of unexpected to me how much we ran into scalability as like the thing that is the most on fire and the most painful to deal with this year. Um, I kind of wasn't expecting us to find um, applications of public blockchains that, that you know, millions of people want to interact with um, this year, I thought it was a couple of years out um, and sort of shocking, but here we are. Um, so in general, my sense is that scalability is to most blockchain projects the most significant pain point and people are willing to deal with the lack of, live with the lack of privacy for a little while if we can give them scalability. Uh, so privacy is not sort of like the research priority that is like screaming in the in my head to be like you must solve me or this all comes crashing down um i have to solve scalability in 2018 or this all comes crashing down um if we don't solve scalability in 2018 we're screwed um but then we have to solve privacy uh so that's that's the situation that we find ourselves in so in terms of um user that users that want to kind of help push this privacy centric forward, um, besides investing into coins and speculate them, how do you think individuals can use their either money or kind of action to, to push that forward? Well, I would say first off, um, every time you use like an application, uh, you are voting with your time and your money. You know, when you open up uh, an app, a website and there's an ad, you know, the company's making money off of the fact that you're on their site. Um, and you know, if you're on, let's say, Facebook Messenger, and you know that there's an alternative, like maybe Signal or something, um, you know, and you care about privacy, choosing to switch over is going to make an impact if enough people do that. And this is where bringing awareness, in my view, is important. And I think uh, having that uh, general conscious to, to think about what you choose and what you use uh, will, will make an impact on the companies. If, you have the network effects that grow and people switch over for certain reasons. This goes back to the earlier point on companies are not willing to change unless there's an incentive, uh, namely that users are vocal or that there's competition that's disrupting their fundamental business model. Uh, those are ways in which companies will react and I think voting with your time and voting with your money is the most effective way here. So yes, I completely agree with Howard's analysis in the sense that like the embrace of privacy preserve like 
we have like a reasonable portfolio of privacy preserving applications now, um, which wasn't really true, you know, two years ago, and is probably going to get a lot better over the next year or so. So if there is a privacy preserving application that meets your other needs, like if Signal is going to work for you as a messenger, use Signal. If Brave is going to work for you as a browser, use Brave. Now, on the other hand, um, well, is that going to be enough? I'm not really sure. So we probably need to do more. We need probably need people to be evangelists for this technology um, and the technologies to come. We need people to be early adopters of these technologies and the technologies that come. Um, and generally, almost anyone can be those, can fill those roles. So what are some of those areas um, where privacy is crucial, but is still undervalued, unrecognized, or like underestimated? Um, well, I would say the internet, when, we, when, when the internet was made, it was not privacy first. Um, the internet only recently has reached large scale adoption on HTTPS, on DNSSEC, et cetera. And uh, to that end, um, I think that the blockchain space is something that is uh, undervalued in terms of privacy. You know, we are right now at the ground floor of building out these blockchain protocols, and we get to call the shots. And to that end, I think integrating a privacy first mentality is really important. Um, it's something that we can actually build out right now, and uh, we can invest money in and resources and motivate students to, to pursue studies in. And this general area of funding acad academics and funding industry to build out protocols that include privacy first uh, is r really valuable and can give us much better security down the line. If you look at the internet, you know, users are now paying the consequences of that today. And that's something that when they first built out that system, they didn't really think about the consequences that far down. And now that we see it manifest, I think with this new generation, we can actually build these things first. So, in terms of big areas where there's basically very little privacy, uh, progress on privacy really being made on the technical front, um, one area is the, like, the telecommunications infrastructure. So we walk around with these tracking devices in our pockets, um, and they're very convenient, and we can communicate with those tracking devices over end-to-end -end encrypted messages, but we still leak a lot of information to telecom companies um, that can do and do do terrible things with it. Uh, the other one is really the uh, sort of healthcare space, um, a sort of privacy of medical records, privacy of medical data, uh, as privacy of sort of biometrics, privacy of DNA data. All of that stuff is, seems to me to be a disaster that's waiting to happen or a disaster that is slowly unfolding. And there's probably not so much technology going into that area right now. There's a lot of cool research papers, but there's very little that's being like translated into practical systems. Yeah, also to add on top of the, what you said about the medical, I think that for, to a certain extent it has to come from the top down. You know, you, if you don't have um, the government kind of implementing a new law that says, okay, everybody needs to change moving forward and, and implement those, those features in, then sometimes there's not a lot of incentive to actually invest in that because there might not be profit from, from doing this. Um, and then just next is the next topic about government funding. Um, so with um, Equifax Bridge, right, like you mentioned earlier, um, which potentially leaked millions of social security numbers, driving licenses, um, who knows what kind of information they leaked and how people are using it today. Um, what do you think governments should, should do better to um, kind of fund crypto um, cybersecurity initiatives to, that give citizens more control over their data and whether they should do that at all? Yeah, um, I think in like the Equifax case, the, the government didn't really do anything. Uh, it was a bit of a slap on the wrist. Uh, and um, my view is that governments are here to incentivize good cybersecurity because the companies themselves fundamentally aren't incentivized right now. Um, companies are kind of complacent until it's too late, and then they announce the breach, and then they say they'll do better next time. Um, but in the case of some companies, it happens again and again. And uh, this is because the government doesn't uh, have certain uh, standards that, that they impose, like whether it be 
uh, financial uh, implications or even reputation uh, implications for these companies. And I think that the government's role should be to provide a stronger stance on this, uh, to, to provide the regulatory oversight, and to incentivize companies uh, to be doing more to ensure that their own cybersecurity is, is up to par for their users. So almost all the t privacy technology that we have to date probably traces its route, its sort of roots to government funding. And that's unfortunate. And also that government funding has become harder to get and less reliable. So one of the things I'm hoping that we get out of this like massive increase in cryptocurrency valuations is sources of funding that are at least competitive, if not as a, and if not more effective in funding the development of privacy technology. That would be a really good outcome. And we have things like the Zcash Foundation and like all of these other cryptocurrency foundations that have large amounts of money. And I am, you know, spending a lot of my time using my power and influence in those in circles to try to drive privacy funding forward. So we know that there's a lot of governments that are looking into these things. You know, it's, some of it is public, some of it is not so public, but they're looking into how blockchain can essentially change or, or, or influence, you know. Um, do you think this should be a concern for them? Um, how this is influenced and how the blockchain technology, um, its ability to provide a greater privacy to people, do you think they're actually looking into that at all? Um, well, blockchain has, um, it has a lot of uh, potential right now. And I think regulators are starting to, to understand that and they're looking into this. Um, it's really important for governments um, uh, to actually spend the money uh, to fund this area and also to help develop it and to better understand it because I think that this technology is going to enable a lot of uh, change. Um, and to that end, um, privacy is one area where th having them directly involved in the dialogue will make sure that they aren't going to feel left out. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions, for example, even in like in Zcash's case where uh, privacy can be a concern. Um, and I think that governments, uh, if they were to, to work on this with, with these projects, um, which they do, um, it helps them to better understand and control the degree of privacy that they would like and to make sure that the regulations are, are built in a way that, that is in, in compliance with what, what they would like. Um, that's something that is going to be a long discussion, I think, and uh, uh, right now with blockchains, there's a lot of value that can be had in terms of efficiency, um, in terms of uh, reducing bureaucracy, and uh, the general throughput and, and new digital economies that can be created are gonna be things that governments should uh, respect and not ignore. One thing I like about how the technology of government interactions with blockchains has unfolded is government surveillance of blockchains has been, is not, is relatively an open secret. Um, you know, people FOIA, you know, how much, you know, governments are spending on chain analysis li licenses. And I'm really glad about all of that because it provides like a significant amount of pressure on the industry to actually deploy effective privacy solutions. Uh, one of the things that was really, so like the internet was largely surveillance free in the 90s and then in 2003 when the government kind of like took the gloves off and went crazy on internet surveillance, no, they did it with highly effective secrecy. Uh, so it wasn't until like a decade later that we really realized that the entire internet was a surveillance architecture. Um, we always knew it could be a surveillance architecture. We didn't realize it was actually operationally a surveillance ar uh, architecture. So we're in a, the, the, the good thing is, is that governments are surve surveilling blockchains a lot. Um, and that's, and they're doing it at an early enough time in the industry that we do, can meaningfully shape the outcomes to make sure that that surveillance is counterbalanced by like, you know, things like uh, uh, mixed nets and snarks and all of the other privacy preserving technology that we're developing. Yeah, so since it's such a so surveillance system, um, maybe you, <laughs> for the people who actually care about privacy here, can you tell us maybe some applications that you know are not too obvious that you've been having your eyes on that maybe using or kind of up and coming um, that provide this privacy preserving um, that people don't know about yet. 
Um, one, one app that I like is uh, Prevail. Uh, this is started uh, by, um, like, uh, there's one Berkeley professor, uh, Professor Raluca Ada Popa. Uh, she has been working on, uh, she's like the CTO of this company, Prevail, which is a secure end-to-end -end messaging, um, like email messaging application. And uh, think of it like Signal, but for emails, like instead of using phone numbers, you have your email addresses that you find each other with. And then uh, when you send uh, uh, messages, these are emails. Um, I like it generally, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a good app. There's a competing privacy-preserving blockchain technology called Mimblewimble uh, that is launching a blockchain this year. And as much as I'm a fan of Zcash, I think Mimblewimble is also really cool. It's, it's definitely one of those things that reminds you how magical and weird blockchains are, because um, it was created by an anonymous, a pseudonym that was using a Harry Potter character, and then the rest of it was coded by people who were using Harry Potter character pseudonyms. Um, and the blockchain is, the technology is named after a spell in Harry Potter. So that seems really cool. Uh, it's cool that stuff like that still happens. It's, it's very cool that continues to see major technical advances in what's possible with blockchain privacy. So, you know, I'm excited about these, about more things going into production. And I'm excited about more things being usable uh, in 2018. So one last question. Where do you think funding should go in terms of privacy in 2018? So I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, so two to three X, we should two to three X academic fundamental research funding. Um, that would, that's like a reasonable goal. Uh, trying to figure out how to make that happen. Uh, that seems, seems relatively doable. Um, we need to sort of scale organizations like Zcash that are able to do, that are doing privacy preserving work already um, and ship uh, more privacy preserving technologies. It's sort of, it's, it's what I think is one of the things that is uh, uh, sort of that Zcash has really shown the way on is a little bit what it looks like to rapidly translate research into a production system. Like, you need to actually form a startup company. You have to build a business model. You actually have to, you have to raise venture capital. You have to deploy that capital effectively. You have to hire the people and retain the team um, to actually do the work. Um, and I think figuring out a way of doing that at a scalable, repeatable level, um, you know, the. Tor, Signal, Zcash have all done a great job of retaining people to work on them for a couple of years to actually, you know, take a pr something from an idea to a practically usable system. Um, academic research doesn't work that way. Academic research is like six months, one year, and then people go on and work on different things. So how, finding a way to like retain teams and scale teams is going to be, I think, the hardest part of this. Um, so from Blockchain at Berkeley, like Blockchain Berkeley works with a lot of Fortune 500 companies like Airbus, Qualcomm, BMW, et cetera. And um, every time that a proof of concept is built, uh, it usually stays at proof of concept. It's really hard to get it to actual deployment. And it's because in the latter stages, um, they realize that, oh, there's some intellectual property or some trade secrets or some user data that doesn't want to be revealed on a blockchain. Maybe it leaks something to other businesses, their, their competitors, or even to other users. And um, to that end, uh, my view is like we should be uh, spending time building out like, smart contract privacy. Um, that's something that I'm personally very interested in and I think is, is something that can be very bullish uh, for the next year, two, or three years. Um, Having that in will uh, enable so many more applications. Um, and uh, if you look at the current ecosystem of, of applications, we don't have so many that are that hot. And I think that one of the fundamental limitations is this lack of privacy. Yeah, I want to add on top of that. Um, I think we've seen that in the blockchain space, um, a lot of people got in after they got educated. And there is a lot of education that needs to be done before you start, whether it's investing or start actually working on research, you know, PhDs that have their own track of what they plan to do, um, for them to change and pivot completely to like blockchain or consensus or protocol, it's kind of hard because they're just uneducated about it and don't see the potential. Um, so I think investing in education and awareness, um, whether it's in the marketing, you know, like sometimes you need to invest in, in, in a good story you know, that, that people can resonate with. 
that then they understand why this is important. Um, when you try to explain them in too much technical terms, they get, they get lost and they're like, okay, this is not me, I, I can't, I don't understand why it's important to me, maybe to him it is. So, I mean, having those stories and good marketing team that, um, the, the privacy product is good, you know, it's needed, but people don't know that it exists yet. So having that, um, more teams kind of work on that part, I, I also think this is something that people should invest more. Um, and yeah, that's the end of the panel. If anybody have any questions, um, feel free. So, you know, building on a blockchain, building business on the blockchain, creating value on the blockchain, it's, it's hard, right? It's expensive, it's risky, um, and it, it lacks business privacy, right? It's hard to make B2B on, on the blockchain, right? So currently, there's a lot of companies, individuals, they're releasing white papers, they're holding ICOs, they're minting capital, right? Um, but, you know, as we see from, you know, 2013, 2014 projects, a lot of them don't pan out because the business is more than protocols, right? Like you say, it requires marketing, it requires a business team, it requires a lot of different things, right? So how do you guys feel about startups who, you know, we're in Germany, who are working with Industry 4.0, who are working with these traditional middle, you know, medium-sized businesses um, that end up using, you know, a standard client service architecture, right? And then moving towards blockchain once the issues with blockchain are solved um, by more capital-rich you know, Fortune 500 companies. You know, is that something that you guys are interested in, or is that, you know, against the, you know, against the the ideology of a company should be using blockchain from the beginning? Um, I would say not everything needs to be on a blockchain. Um, there's a lot of hype right now, and everyone wants to blockchainify everything. Um, they want to tokenize all these services and products. That's nice, um, but I think that you know, blockchain has has its view, and uh, its view is. You have mutually distrusting parties coming together to do some trusted logic um, without a central authority. And to that end, if you have that situation, I think the blockchain makes sense. I'm certainly not opposed to like hybrid uh, architectures or just centralized architectures. It's just about seeing what is the le legitimate use case if you do have these mutually distrusting parties. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I'm, I think that it's, it's per perfectly reasonable. Um, the, the, the general trend uh, is that a lot of the fundamental issues in scalability and in privacy um, are things that are gonna be resolved down the road. And to that end, if that's the best that they can do today, and because they want to get throughputs today, um, that's what they need to do. Uh, but um, as long as they're working towards that, that goal, you know, it's important to be enthusiastic about it, but I fundamentally like companies that are trying to disrupt and, and fundamentally change that from the ground up. If they can build the protocols and actually innovate on that through research or through collaborations, um, and to make that scalability and the privacy aspects be resolved in-house, ad hoc right now, uh, because their road, road and timeline is uh, that far out, then um, you know, I like those a lot. <laughs> Yeah, just also to add on top of that, I, I don't think, like, like Howard said, not everybody needs an ICO. And a lot of teams are doing an ICO to raise money, and they think that with money, they can solve the problems. Which um, we've seen that the people that have the capabilities of doing this research today, um, that are not doing ICO, they're just trying to solve the problem without an ICO. And hiring them is almost impossible because they said, well, I don't need you to hire me, I can do it on my own if I wanted to and I don't do it, you know? So we don't necessarily invest in, you know, we don't, we don't invest in ICO, it doesn't make sense. You know, if, if Amazon, we, we're working with Amazon, we're working with big companies as well, and we see how they think about stuff. Uh, we're working with a lot of innovation centers and R&D centers, um, and they're investing a lot of money into this type of research. That's why they're investing in a lot of uh, PhDs and professors. 
uh, to help them kind of figure out this, this, these issues as, as outsourcing. Um, and, and having necessarily teams that, that claiming that they can fix this problem after they raise ICO, um, it's not necessarily true. Um, as if you're investing in those, you just have to make sure you do the, your due diligence um, and see who's behind it and, and, and even realize why do they need to raise money for this, to try this, this solution they're trying to solve. Um, a lot of companies today, they, they, they try to be an expert in, for example, um, the, Zika, the Zika snarks, and, but they, their business model is more consulting. So we're gonna build something and then sell consulting services um, as, as a revenue model, not through an ICO. And I think that's more respected um, because the understanding ICO makes no sense. I would say that the sort of fast, optimistic side on both the throughput and the privacy side of things means that we might actually have solutions on like a startup's sort of product development timeline. Like by the time you figure out like what your product is, what your market is, like p blockchains may scale and blockchains may be private enough to actually work. Uh, because yes, the downside of having all of this funding become available is a lot of people raise money without having the slightest idea of what to do with it. But also a lot of people who've been working on things with a couple for, for several years suddenly had enough money to actually start executing on what they had been working on for several years. So I do think the low-hanging fruit in this space is actually probably, like, the entire blockchain research funding world was maybe like $10 million a year uh, for the last, like, four years until we hit 2017. And then it became hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So, yes, a lot of that money is going to be wasted, but there was a, there's a lot of stuff in between that. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that deliver in 2018, and blockchains will be a lot better. I mean, I'm not a venture capitalist, uh, but as a practical matter, I kind of feel like blockchains are like a steamroller that are going to run everything over. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, I'm a super, I, it took me a long time in this space to be convinced. Like, I've been doing this since 2012-ish, and it was February that I was, like, sold. That, like, blockchains are, like, an unstoppable force in terms of transforming the way people's financial relationships and the way capital markets work. But at this point, I think they're an unstoppable force for transforming the way capital markets work. Is there one more question? Thank you.